Forward Base Solano at Zeno Island by Tactical Cat Episode 11 Till I Die Part 2 An airwing sailor scanned the expanse of gray decks that recolored the sea. He was just a flight mechanic who had nothing to do with whatever the bigwigs decided would win the war. His job was to wave glowing light sticks at planes and hope the pilots weren't blind which was the standard assumption in the trade, since he had joined the Navy, not the Air Force. It seemed like it would be a usual 731st day after the previous 730 they had spent visiting new bases, turning the oceans green, then continuing on. Stick-waving had certainly not trained him for what he would see next. The silver-gray jewels, with their water-shielded hulls, swam toward his fleet. There was agitation in the Snoopy team up at the Vulture's Row. A scout runner alerted the captain. What was that thing hanging from the sky's hooks? Whatever it was, it harbored no fondness for his fleet. All at once, artillery rained down, and the floating island released a small surge of fighters into the air. For a splash! A bomb grazed the tower behind him, barely missing the bridge at hop. Bombers from Admiral Nau's carrier? All of a sudden, he found himself frantically waving his sticks. Their own air wing was deploying. I thought we'd beat them yesterday. Admiral Nau could see the entire battlefield below. The heads of each division around Sawana base had converged in his battle bridge at the bottom of the island vessel ship carrier boat base. Commander Irvin... Lieutenant Commander Stin, Lieutenants Angela and Armin, and even Lieutenant Commander Mikasa had migrated here, leaving their subordinates in charge of each of their respective divisions. Let's start by taking out their supply. Now moved his first pawn into the center right square. All right, if you insist, commented Admiral Nigel, reflecting the move with his own pawn. He was stuck down here in the bridge of a normal carrier. An impressive city on the sea, certainly. And until half a minute ago, the Federation's supreme piece of work. Somehow, though, it seemed a little insignificant compared to what Admiral Nell had just presented to him. Like a young boy, contemplating the stars. If you would so dearly like a last chess match, he bantered, let's play. A flurry of aircraft appeared around his fleet, he was still bitter from the last time he had lost to his underclassmen before graduating the academy. Such a standard opener, muttered now, hands thrust into a holographic dashboard. You did that one last time. A transparent gyroscope spun to the right of his HUD. Driving this thing was certainly less straightforward than directing a ship. He had to ensure that its rotational axis remained even, as well as adjusting its forward momentum. The only training that could teach him how to drive such a thing was sheer experience. He gave out a few commands, and the officers scattered around went about their business, deploying a series of small deck cannons through the grass. His knight was in play. Sawano base loomed above Admiral Nigel's fleet and hovered. A few bombers tickled its surface, and the chess match continued on. In terms of numbers, it was an utterly lopsided conflict. Now had thrown five ships in a floating island base at the Federation's primary offensive task force in the Eastern Theater, stocked with 50 ships, excluding their logistics fleet. Even with the main cannon ensconced in the heart of Samano Base, it would not be an easy day. As the fleets exchanged shots, Admiral Nigel noticed his carriers struggling. That giant flea in the air had so much field information from its vantage point in the sky that the ashes had unprecedented accuracy rates, and the constant flak from Samono base had instated an immediate no-fly zone for his pilots. For some reason, however, his own forward ships had seen surprisingly little action. Now's fleet had been concentrating fire behind the front lines. Exactly what were they wasting shots on? Admiral, supply lines out. Check. That's what they were wasting shots on. 
Well, that was a bit of an oversight. Nigel grinned. Not an evil grin. He had never taken pleasure in death, but it was uncomfortably confident. It's not that simple, Admiral, now, quipped Nigel. Zip! All of a sudden, a laser split across the sky. You won't be outdoing me with that hunk of dirt. You are missing something. He slid his bishop forward to block Nau's check. At Sawano base, an alarmed crew murmured under the electric drone of the charging main cannon. Damage report, ordered Nau. We need to be careful around that laser. Where did it come from? Sir, it struck the docks. It came from the island below. We're already several kilometers past the vertical boundary line. Island? They scanned the landmass that had appeared on them all of a sudden. Commander Irvin, ordered now. Do you recognize... It's their HQ, interjected Commander Irvin, inferring from his division's reports. He turned the recon scanners onto the con continent below. Nigel's task force must have been retreating back to their headquarters in the Eastern Theater. Being so near their HQ meant that Nigel could produce reinforcements and resupply at any moment until they destroyed the entire navy. Those prospects seem somewhat hopeful. Hold position, now announced. Have them draw back a bit. Let's hold back here. The jewels coasted to a cruise in the base's shadow. He squinted at the coastline. Fleet Admiral Nigel had nearly drawn them into a range of coastal cannons. A report chimed in from one of the jewels. Admiral, it's kin. We took out six of their cruisers, but the smiling dolphin is back. I'm low on torpedoes. Adam supply runs are too slow. What he means to say, qualified Toby, as they had now changed radio frequencies and encrypted their communication lines, is that as powerful as the jewels are, we are going to run out of ammo. Thulner, status report, declared now. The captains may not have realized just where they were yet. How does it look down there? There was only a hearty laughter from Thulner. Been mostly ramming them down, sir, he reported, to save ammo. Only a few shots left. We'll hold out for a little longer, but we gotta end this thing soon. Yuki continued now. Get some eyes on that coastal defensive line to the east. I want to know what that is, in detail. This area of the sea had never been scouted since the war began. It was the furthest they had gotten into enemy territory in five years since the aliens had first landed and contaminated the seas. A conservative guess here was as good as not having any information. I, sir, Yuki replied. And the jewels dispersed across the fleet, the Sonos of Fern keeping furthest back, XLTT enthusiastically shaking hands with its new friends. Toby sailed just out of range of the coast, awaiting the recon reports. Being this far into enemy territory was precarious and thrilling all at once. Thulner pulled up broadside to one of Admiral Nigel's escorts and unloaded a barrage, but he only fired half of the cannons to conserve ammo. A host of men jumped overboard off the escort. Why don't we just decapitate the head? He pulled over the comms. Toby, take down those escorts on your side. We'll expose them and surround the Admiral. Toby peered down the bridge over the prow and prepared to relay the orders. All of a sudden, Another massive laser zipped overhead. They traced its path into the sky behind them. No. He was stunned into silence. What is it? called in Ken, with no visibility past the sea surface. Yuki ran to the back of the bridge and glanced up. Forward base Sawano spilled out clumps of dirt and metal plates that had lined the hallways a few seconds ago. The laser had cut Zeno Island in half, like a sandbag target split open by a sword. Admiral, Simon Obeys is... Foner's voice cut out as his entire ship rocked. A close-range machine gun drilled bullets through his tower. We don't have time to worry about the Admiral, announced Yuki, condensed reconnaissance reports in hand. Had him better hurry, she thought. Recon's back. There's another fleet inbound. We're looking at hundreds this time. Well, we don't have the firepower for this. And the coastal defense is... Railguns. 
Someone murder the sea god, exclaimed Toby, exasperated. But they weren't even certain what railguns could do. That tech had only been authorized for Salmon a base last year. They had spent since then trying to develop it. How did Admiral Nigel build so much infrastructure out of tech that wasn't supposed to exist yet? Now we need to worry about the Admiral, continued Toby. Do we engage? Do we pull back? There was no way they could win, but as a formality, they had to hear it from their superior. Admiral Eurydice? tried Thulner, static interference fighting his voice for supremacy. Cannons fired on, artillery streaked the skies, fighters dipped just over the sea surface to deliver their explosive packages. The air was getting louder and louder, the waves taller and taller. Till the Admiral wakes up. They could only assume that the Admiral would wake up. Let's hold position here and do our best. For the Admiral. Toby crawled out from beneath a partially melted bulkhead door that had barely missed his vitals. It had pinched his right leg in, though. Give me a status report, he called across the bridge, limping back to his usual position at the console. Anyone injured? Are we still floating? An officer crawled up onto his knees to reach across the console and pressed a few buttons. Good here, sir. Engineering says the whole structural integrity is intact. We're still in this. A few casualties reported from medical. Toby turned to the communications chief. How about the others? How's the fleet? Toby's song he heard over the comms in a familiar monotone drone. Are you alive? It was reassuring to hear Ken's voice, but he had the foreboding premonition that they were standing on the precipice of surrender. He glanced down to his leg as blood trickled over his left eye. We are, uh, mostly here, he reported. We're intact. For now, he thought. I'm going to pass out from blood loss if medical doesn't get here soon, though. I'm glad, continued Ken. I can't reach Thoner's son and Yuki's son. No word from the Admiral since 627. It was currently 943. Samano base had been hit three hours ago. That was a long time to go without any word. Just does, huh? Observed Tovi, scanning the sea from his windows. I need backup, reported Ken, staring down the immobilized smiling dolphin from the coordinate. He had won. He had finally outdone the Fleet Admiral's plaything as the morning came to a close, striking it head-on with a torpedo painted with kittens, an annoyed order from Ken after constant frustrations. The victory had proven short-lived, however, as five other submarines from Fleet Admiral Nigel's reinforcement task force had moved in to take the Dolphin's place. I do not think we'll be getting out of this one easily, agreed Toby. He, too, had woken to a complete surround. Five battle cruisers had their main cannons aimed directly at the ashes. Without the support of the rest of the fleet, the damage they had done to Admiral Nigel's task force was comparable to a mosquito trying to sting through a clamorous calloused hand. The situation was dire. Prepare to lower the colors, announced Toby. Everything within him yelled. Alarms blared in his mind. The years and years of victories he had secured at the Bridge of the Ashes until this point seemed to wash away in the downpour of imminent loss. He considered his options. If he and Ken surrendered, they could at least guarantee the safety of their crew. There was no point in dragging out a battle like this. He pulled himself up to the edge of the bridge with his arms and scanned across the horizon in every direction. The continent slumbered to the east. Before him to the south, Admiral Nigel's task force stalled them like predators after a watering gazelle. To the west, where home territory beckons miles beyond the horizon, a shimmering dab of painted sunlight emblazoned the waves. He squinted into the sun's reflection. Rising up in the midst of the white, the Sona Sofern drifted aimlessly, 
its entirety aflame. His radio barely caught the chatter of Yuki's pilots. They were scrambling for a place to land on the continent. Don't surrender, pumped his heart. Don't give in yet, implored his blood through his veins. Till I hovered just before the prow. He could hear the chime of the crystals within its chains, the boom of the blaze within its blades. I'll leave my soul by your side, it seemed to say. Though we fall apart between hell's divide, I'll leave my soul by your side. He stared at the twin blades at the window, dancing in the easterlies of the intertropical convergence zone, like the kite of a child, ignorant of an incoming windstorm. Till I die, they bellowed. He inhaled an angry breath. I do not have any choice, he exclaimed back to the blades. If we keep pressing on, they will all die. Despair sealed the cracks on the bridge. There's nothing else I can do. The others are dead. The Admiral hasn't said anything for hours, and someone obeys us in two pieces. How it had managed to remain afloat that way was as mysterious to the ground fleet as was the technology that had put it in the air in the first place. Either way, it had not moved since that laser had split it this morning. Yuki is gone, he lamented slipped silently and competently away like usual, didn't bother to tell anyone if she's hurt or dying, just delivered a report in the battlefield instead of herself. If the pilots survive, it will be a miracle. Let me pray for you, continued the viciously upbeat chime, till I die. And who knows where Thulner is? Probably heroed himself to death, trying to save some poor sod who doesn't even need saving. He doesn't ever quit. He's the one who needs saving, but all he can focus on is everyone else. I get it. I know it sucks, but we need him too. He began at last to realize what he was saying. Yuki and Thulner were probably dead. The Admiral was probably dead. Adam was probably dead or captured, if Into the Sky had yet to finish him. I won't even guess where the darn penguin is after all those steroids. Next I know he'll start flying. His nose picked up the stench of oil. Don't let me be your wound. The onslaught of Tilly's voice kept on, taunting him. Wash off all you've been bound by. Always be safe and sound. I am praying for you. Why the hell am I still alive? Damn it, Admiral. Don't leave me to clean up your mess. If I die here, I'll haunt you forever. All of you. He seized his comms device from where it had plugged into the console and prepared a ship-wide announcement. All of a sudden, he was thrown into the wall of the bridge. The ashes rocked on its hull, reeling from an impact. What's going on? Oh, Toby tried to yell out, lifting himself up with his arms. But his voice was just a whisper. His leg was throbbing, his vision closing in, probably due to lack of oxygen. Someone give me at his port, but he could barely see. And then I am going to pass out for As the ashes tilted back upright, Toby caught a glance at the window of forward base Sawano. His body had taken too much damage. He didn't want to move, so his view was limited by a sharp upward angle from where the ship had thrown him onto the floor. He barely noticed the medic attending to his leg. Going to need a new leg after this one, I bet, he joked. But the medic did not laugh. Alarms rang out to the pattern of malfunctioning engine power and steering. Tilly's encouragement had been nothing but a cruel taunt. He crawled back toward his usual station and felt about for his comms device. With a final breath, he mustered the wind to say, Lower the colors. As of... He squinted to read the fading numbers in the screen corner. 0956. The ashes is surrendering. <laughs>